Hello, hello, it's Mike Searles, the Comeback Coach, on a mission to help put 100,000 people back on track for personal success. I'm joined today by a special guest, it's British-born author and entrepreneur Steve Sims. I recorded the following conversation with Steve less than 24 hours ago, so it's still nice and steaming hot. Steve Sims' day job is to make the impossible possible. With his help and expertise, his clients' fantasies and their wildest dreams come true. For example, getting married in the Vatican, being serenaded in Italy by Andrea Batelli at the feet of Michelangelo's Statue of David, and connecting with powerful business moguls like Elon Musk. These are just a few of the many projects he's worked on. His client and friends list reads like a who's who of the mega successful and famous in the world. They just so happen to be among the wealthiest people on the planet. Steve's book is titled Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen, which is very relevant for anybody making a comeback to get back on track. You'll find the book on Amazon, and he also self-narrates the audio version, which you can find on Audible. So let's get into the conversation with my new friend, Steve Sim. Well, here he is, the man himself, Steve Sims, and I'm so happy and uh, been looking forward to this conversation uh, for so long. Steve, welcome to this conversation. Thanks for having me. And um, well, the audience has been uh, previewed on your background, what you do, the book. Uh, actually, Steve, it's, it's through your book that I came to know of you. Actually, a friend online recommended an interview uh, on YouTube and said once you watch this guy you'll want to get more of him and he was right so then I did some <laughs> I was I did some research and I see you've got a book uh, titled Blue Fishing and I and I like to buy audible versions and so you narrate your own book titled Blue Fishing the art of making things happen and that really is the perfect segue into what this guy is all about now a mate of yours or somebody else describes you as a guy who gets shit what does that mean? Um, it means I'm stupid enough to try anything. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm amazed at how many people out there that are scared of things. Well, the beautiful thing about me um, is I was too ignorant to be scared. Um, so I would literally, someone would want something and I would go and try and make it happen. And while everyone's going, well, you know, I want to, if I, let me give you an example. If you go up to your mate and say, hey, money not being the, uh, the, the object of, of issue here, if you could do anything in the world, what would it be? And they may turn around and they'd go, oh, I want to play piano with Elton John, or I want to you know, sit on the front seats of a basketball game, or I want to do one-on-one -on -one with so-and-so. And they will tell you that, and then they will go, but I don't know how to do that. And ah, why would he want to have... They will spend two seconds telling you what they want to do and then 10 minutes why it's not possible. Mm. And I've never understood that ratio. So for me, I wanted to knock around with rich people. Rich people are funny enough, just as terrified about asking for things as people with no money. So I became that conduit with no worry that would just go up and go, Hey, I've got a very powerful client that wants to sit front row of a fashion week, wants to go down to the Titanic, wants a drum lesson with guns and roses wants a piano lesson with Elton John, wants a guitar lesson with ZZ Top. How do we make it happen? And I would not expect to pull these things off, but also not be frightened of attempting. And when you're not frightened of attempting things, something strange happens. You actually start achieving it. And when you start getting empowered with, hang on, I just sent someone down to the Titanic. I just put someone on stage with that rock band. I just got someone to a walk on roll on that movie, you become empowered. And it's strange, but the less you get less no's and more yeses to the extreme ridiculous things you ask for. Your experience. Uh, so Steve Sims, uh, for our audience members, he's a, a highly successful entrepreneur. He's got um, a number of businesses, including Sims Distillery, which is a membership community. We can talk about that. Also, uh, tasteofblue.com, which is about updating your lifestyle. And a very active Facebook group, which I'm in, and I recommend you uh, have a look too if you're an entrepreneur interested in 
ticking along. Um, an entrepreneur's advantage with Steve Sims. And you're, one of your, now you've got three children and one of your children is Henry Sims and he's quite actively involved with you in that, isn't he? <laughs> it's funny because, you know, kids, let's be serious, kids are annoying. And, you know, they, <laughs> they grow up and they look at dad and they go to school and that's, they spend like six hours at school being told you've got to fit in this box. These are the correct answers. No other answers will do. And they brainwash you a certain way. And then they come home. And if the parents are entrepreneurs, that's, that's sitting in the garage, twinkling around on a motorcycle, chatting with someone on their earbuds, doing a one and a half million dollar deal. And they go, how, how does this work? You know, how, how do you do? And so it's very hard to teach entrepreneurism to kids without throwing them in it. And I remember as my, my son was growing up, he was an engineer and he, he wanted the answers. He wanted the factual end result of this calculation gets me this result. And let's be serious. In the world of entrepreneurs, we don't know that. We take risks. We get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's the way we are. And one day he just approached me and he went, I want to see. So I took him to an event. I took him to an event I was, I was speaking at. He got to meet these other dysfunctional, creative disruptors that were just doing things their way. And he was like, hang on a minute. I, I like the creativity here. So it was a full 180. He went from being the, the, the anal retentive engineer to going, hey, I want to take a shot. I want to do so. I'm aggravated enough to make a change. And it's been, a, it's been beautiful for me to be able to see how it's grown. He helps me with my speakeasies. He's very uh, uh, communicative in the, uh, the Entrepreneur's Advantage Facebook page. He has his own business, Zesty Owl. So it's very cool to see your son suddenly being able to run at his own pace and to hold himself up high. So it's, it's really cool. Very cool indeed. And I can see why wouldn't you be a proud dad and I can see, and I know that you're a proud family man. Um, your wife of um, how many years? Forever. We we met. Funny enough, we met as kids when we were like five and six years old. We went to the first school together. Then we moved, so we didn't know each other. And then we met again when we were like fifteen and sixteen. So I am the boring man of a one woman. And that's, you know, she terrifies, scares me, arouses me. She's like the entire package. So, yeah, it, forever. We've been together since birth. How good is that? And the audience that we're speaking with, uh, Steve, are people who are interested in personal development and growth. Uh, quite often they're coming from um, or bouncing back or getting back on track from a set or an adversity of some kind. So they're not somebody who has never experienced success before. They're very likely somebody who's been very successful and then have lost their mojo. It could be health, could be finances, could be a relationship, could be anything, or all of those plus more. And so on that, now you've got, you, you're married to the one woman, you're a one lady man, and you're not going to tell me there's nev never been an argument, are you? Oh, hell no. There's been like World War III, um, you know, nuclear. No, it, it's not been smooth sailing. Who wants smooth sailing, yeah. you know? It's not until you go toe-to-toe -to -toe and, like, I'm 240 pound of ugly, you know? I've been on the door. I've, I've, I've danced with people in, in clubs and played the slappy game. It's never bothered me. My wife's, like, 115 pound if she's soaking wet and five foot five and terrifies the shit out of me because I know that she's, she can hold her own. So, no, I, I'm a great believer that you don't, you don't understand someone or you don't get to meet someone when everything's going right, including yourself. It's when the shit hits the fan that the colors come out. So you go, oh, hang on a minute. That person's got resources. That person's got balls. That person's got you know, cuts for whatever you want to call it. But the bottom line of it is, and again, including yourself, until the shit hits the fan, you don't know what you're capable of. You don't know what your team's capable of. I've had people working in my companies and then the shit's hit the fan and they've hidden in the corner, squalling their eyes out. Mm. And I've realized 
you ain't got what it takes, you're fired. And then I've had other people when the shit's hit the fan and they're like, all right, okay, time to call the troops in. How do we solve this? How do we make something out of this? How do we repair this? How do we make it? And that's go, okay, now I can see the colors. That's the person I want. So until, until it goes wrong, you really don't know what they're capable of and you don't know what you're capable of. So in my relationship, including my son, I have had balls out yelling competitions with him. And it's in those moments that I've gone, oh, okay, he can hold his own, all right? Respect. So no, I wouldn't it be a ball in life if everything was perfect? Absolutely. I, I don't think I'd want that one. No, no. Something like, no, all right. So if I had to sum up Steve Sims, uh, I'm only meeting you right for five minutes on an, on a podcast interview, but what I know of Steve Sims from uh, the book, um, the interviews that I've watched and some research I've done, uh, balls as big as bowling balls, and he flies them up the flagpole every friggin' Monday morning for the world to see and have a go at kicking them. One of the things that I really admire about Steve Sims and the Steve Sims story is the background. And because you finished school at 15 and you come from the East End of London and tell us the story and tell our audience the story of how your, your working life started as a bricklayer in the family's bricklayer business. So I left school at the age of 15. Uh, I was young for my year, but didn't have, I didn't even know what college was. So, you know, got kicked out of school at 15 uh, with a bare minimum of grades. Um, I had one day that I slept in at home and then the following day, dad kicked to bed at 4.30 in the morning and went, right, you're on the building site with me. And I thought, is this it? You know, now, bear in mind, this was in the 80s. So I didn't have Instagram and Facebook, Facebook to point out how inadequate my life was. It was just an internal feeling that went, can this be it? You know, have I got to get up at 4.30 every morning and work hard? And I'll be completely blunt, and it's a horrible thing to say, but I hated my family. I was so bitter that I thought, this is my life. I'm getting up at 4.30 in the morning. I'm going to get rained on. I'm going to smack my hands up with bricks. I'm going to walk in the post. I'm going to come home every day wet, cold, and filthy at like 6, 7 o'clock at night, have some food, have a bath, and then go to bed, and then wake up in the morning and do it again. And I thought, that's my life. And it wasn't until I hit my early 20s that I suddenly realized I had been taught what I was capable of. I had been resilient. I'd never been hungry. You know, the bath was always warm. I was always hugged before I went to bed. I was always told I was loved. So I suddenly realized that my life, while devoid of money, was wealthy in every other lesson it could possibly be. And I just had this hard work in life. But again, it showed me what I was capable of. And one day, they often say, oh, you know, was there a turning point in your life? There's been hundreds. Mm. But this was the first one that ignited it like a rocket. One day I was on the building site. And my dad said to me, right, you're the laborer today because we're shorthanded and we need you to bring some bricks up. So I had a big pile of bricks on my shoulder. And health and safety, you know, you couldn't do this today. But I had this big pile of bricks on my shoulder. And with the other one hand, I'm climbing up a ladder up about three stories to drop the bricks off for the bricklayers. I get to the top of the ladder and there's my dad. Next to him is his brother, my uncle. Next to him are my two cousins that were older than me. Older than me. One was like late teens, like 18, 19. And the other one was like 25. Okay. And they both used to pick on me. That's what, that's what brothers and cousins do. Mm-hmm. And then next to them was my 80 year old granddad still on the building site. So I saw me like 15, 16 years old, all the way up to being 80. I saw my entire family lifeline on that building site and it hit me. And it was like 9.30 in the morning, 10 o'clock goes off. And in England, you have a tea break time where everyone tries to get out of the rain, huddle up in like a little caravan and try to get warm for half an hour before we go out again. So I ran into the caravan And my granddad is trying to get warm around a little heater, pouring a cup of tea out of his flask. And I, you know, I'm 16 years old, so I had no diplomacy. And I ran up to him. Now, my family's Irish. My granddad was like seven foot one. Mm -hmm. He was a 
he was a brute. Now, the funny thing was, my dad was about five foot six, and I was about five foot ten at the time. So it was very funny how my dad was the shorter one of them. But I ran up to my granddad, and I went, granddad, granddad. And I remember this word for word. I went, granddad, granddad. Did you ever think you'd be doing this when you were this old? Now, that was the kind of remark that should have been met with a smack in the nose. <laughs> it was rude. It was aggressive. It was very undiplomatic. <laughs> My granddad didn't even look at me. He was still blowing on his tea to cool it down before he took his sip. And again, I remember these words accurately. He said, son, if you don't quit today, you'll be me tomorrow. Huh? And then he carried on drinking his tea. Didn't look at me. The entire caravan went quiet. Right. It was like, oh, my God. Yeah. And I came, uh, the, the bell rang. Everyone started running out of the caravan to get back on the building site. And I went tearing up to my dad. Now, my dad hated being called dad on the building site. You know, he had this name, Cuz. You know, a little Irish nickname. And, I, and he was like, always call me Cuz. Of course, this moment had been so massive for me. I was like, dad, 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 dad. And he's like, shut up, what? And I ran up to him and I went, dad, I, I, I was up there and I saw you and then I saw my uncle and I went back in. I saw the camera and I ran up the ground. I said, granddad, did you ever think you'd be doing it? And he said to me, if I don't quit today, and I was babbling like an idiot. And I went, I have to quit. Now, at that moment, my granddad walked behind me. Now, when a seven foot one man walks behind you, you know there's a man behind you, you know? <laughs> and I remember my dad. And again, I told you, my dad's short. My dad looked up to my granddad and literally had to look up. Granddad stopped behind me. I could feel him and smell him. He smoked a lot. And he had. The, I remember the smell of these cigarettes. And he was behind me. My, gran, my dad looked at my granddad. My granddad looked at my dad. And my dad looked at me and he went, we're light-handed, but you finish Friday. I went... All right, all right, and I finished. Now, sadly, that was the last time I saw my granddad. Never got the chance to tell my granddad that, hey, I'm all right, but it's because of you. Um, but I left on Friday. My mum, oh, my God, my mum, literally that night, my dad said, oh, Steve's quitting. Uh, he leaves on Friday. He's going to go and do what he can do. My dad was fine with it, Okay. And, um, but my mum straight away came bowling into my bedroom and went, you think you're better than us, don't you? Oh. And I went, whoa, whoa, no. I just think maybe I'm better than this for me. You know, I want to see what I'm capable of. I want to try different things. Stubborn Irish lady. She was like, you think you're better. And, and sadly, my relationship with her was never good again. Okay. I think there was a bit of jealousy. But I literally, like all entrepreneurs, went on a journey of countless bad jobs. I tried so many different things. Stockbroker, um, DJ, uh, truck driver, cake salesman, insurance salesman, door-to-door -door book sales. You know, I tried so many things that I was ill-equipped to do that, funny enough, I realized one day sitting in the pub being poor, you know, we all know what it's like to be poor. And I was in this pub. I, I turned up on a motorcycle. I always ride motorcycles. And I looked at everyone. And I realized everyone in that bar was a broke-ass biker. And I thought to myself, well, hang on a minute. That's what I am. I need to change the room I'm in. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I literally started hanging out at wine bars, you know. And I looked stupid. But I hung out. What? By I could afford three beers in my pub, but I could only afford one <laughs> in a wine bar because the beers were so expensive. But I needed to change my environment. I need, and I went out watching people. How do rich people interact with each other? And what was really stunning? How do the middle management want to be flaky, pretend millionaires interact with each other? Hmm. And, and it just started that way. And the funny enough, I ended up getting a job on the doors and not as a bouncer. And I started because I was a bouncer and I was working on all these different clubs. I started knocking around with the rich guys going, Hey, I'm working on this club on Thursday. We've got such and such celebrity coming in. 
do you want me to get you into the club? And they would be like, yeah. And I'd be like, great, 200 bucks each. And I started just trying to find a way to communicate with rich people. And the daft thing is, I thought to myself, if I have a Rolodex of rich people, what will I end up becoming? And that was it. Uh, without realizing it, I launched the world's largest uh, experiential concierge firm, not because I'm good with people, because if, you know, if anyone Googles me, I'm not warm and fluffy. Um, but I did it just because I wanted to be in the presence of rich people. I wanted to be in the room with a rich guy and be able to turn around and go, hey, Mike, how come you're rich and I'm not? And that's what I would do. I would just ask, how do you make that decision? How did you get over that failure? Now, you, you pulled it up already, Mike. You said a lot of the people here have had failures. They've been successful. Well, entrepreneurism is like a heartbeat. Doo -doo, doo -doo. Mm -hmm. You have the highs, you have the lows. The beautiful thing about having a high is you got there. And when you get to the low, and I'm giving you guys a tidbit here, one of the biggest things I learned from the millionaires and billionaires that I've dealt with, and I've worked with Peter Diamandis, Elon Musk, Sir Elton John, Richard Branson, I've worked with people far richer that you've never even heard of. Yeah. And I noticed there was one trait that successful people have. Notice the word I said was successful, not wealthy. Successful people become wealthy. You can start being successful just by changing your mindset. This was the one thing they all had in common. You know, powerful pause there. Whenever they failed, rather than leaning back and holding their head and throwing themselves a pity party, they lean forward into the failure and go, right, where did that go wrong? And that's the main difference. Successful people lean into a failure as an education. Entrepreneurs and wannabes lean back going, oh my God, I lost five grand. Woe is me. My life's over. Boo hoo. That's the big difference. Successful people lean in. Unsuccessful lean people lean back. Boy, oh boy, what a pearl of wisdom just dropped on us then. And um, I mean, you can still we could get that in theory. I mean, it sounds lovely if we just consider it as a theoretical philosophy on success, you know. You're coming from the experience where you've, you've lived many times when the shit has hit the fan. And people, mm. when, when our audience members, Steve, read your book or listen to it on Audible, Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen, uh, they, will, they will read some of your stories. And uh, I wanted to just... So many things I want to talk about. We're going to run out of time, but uh, <laughs> there's so many. It's a great book. All right. Thanks for that pearl of wisdom. Love it. You're a guy who works with and works for millionaires and billionaires. You're the guy that people have come to. Uh, and I saw an interview of yours just re filmed recently um, where you're talking about how wealthy people last thing they want to be known as when approached and in conversation is wealthy people. They want to be known as people. Can you just expand on that, please? Yeah, um, I have. I throw these events around uh, America, and we're going to go international, called speakeasies. And I always ask people before they turn up, what's your problem? You know, I want to know what's wrong that we can actually answer. And we had one of the people turn around and said, I'm intimidated with people with money. Now, the daft thing is, we all know what it's like to communicate with people with no money because we've been in a position with no money, okay? We know what that's like. We don't all know what it's like to be able to communicate with millionaires or billionaires because we've not always been a millionaire and billionaire. I've never been a billionaire, okay? So I, there were people that were intimidated. And so I thought to myself, well, okay, I'm gonna run through how to speak to a billionaire because we had uh, um, in the concierge firm that I had, we had, uh, I think it was 70-something 70, 70 of our 93 clients were billionaires, okay? So oh. I, was co I was constantly dealing with billionaires. And the one reason I went for billionaires or high-end millionaires was because paying for it would never be a conversation I ever have, you know? So that was, I always wanted to get the monetary side out of the way. 
So there were people that were very intimidated. So I did a live stream and you can find it on YouTube under Steve D. Sims. Um, it's free of charge, so there's no pitch. But I thought to myself, I'm going to reveal the three myths of how to speak to a billionaire. And then I said, and I've got a little surprise for you. And what I did in the video was I actually phoned up one of my friends and clients and I went, hey, you're a billionaire. Come on, we're going to have a laugh. And I brought this billionaire on the, on the video and openly just said, look, you're a billionaire. How does that piss you off when people come up to you knowing that you're a billionaire? And we had this very relaxed and I'm, I'm astonished at how powerful people found it. But I wanted to have a conversation, you know, with my kind of jokey attitude that got people how to understand what's important for, for a billionaire. And the three things basically came down to it. They want to be spoken to as a person because a billionaire, and this is going to sound stupid, but think about it. A billionaire is a poor person with a lot of money. Mm. That's all it is. If you look at someone just as a checkbook, that's all it is. They've just got more money than you. Okay. They've also failed way more times than you. Mm. Okay. That's the other thing. And then the third thing is now that they've got money and they failed and become empowered as to what they can do. And more importantly, what they can't, they value their time very, very highly. In fact, they value their time more than most people. So you've got to get into a billionaire. If that's your client demographic and provide them with impact, that's going to help their life. If you can go up to a billionaire and go, Hey, I've got a service that can save you 10 minutes in a day. That's going to interest a billionaire because they know what 10 minutes of that time is worth. So I had Navin Jan come in and we just had this whole YouTube banter and joke about what it's like to talk about a billionaire. How does it piss you off when people come up to you and go, whoa, you're a billionaire. Can you give me some money? And it, it really was a fun video, but that's the kind of stuff I like to do. Excellent. And you can find Steve Sims interviews just go to YouTube and search the name Steve Sims and his channel will come up and I recommend that as well. In fact, why don't you start there um, and while you're waiting for the book to come through uh, from Amazon. Uh, that's what I did. When I read the book, there was something, there was a line in the book, Steve, that really stood out to me. I love it. I'd love you to expand on it, particularly in the context of somebody who um, has felt a kick in the balls. They're down on their knees, perhaps, but they really want to get back up and get going and get back into the groove again. And your saying in the book uh, is, it's not about IQ, it's about I can. Yeah. Um, the book is funny. Um, because when you write a book, you kind of, you write what you do. So if I asked you this morning and I said to you, hey, hey man, you know, Walk me through how you breathe. You know, walk me through how you go to the toilet. Walk me through how you make your coffee in the morning. Walk me through how... all of these things you do on instinct without thinking. When you actually start putting them into a book, you suddenly start realizing that what you do instinctively, other people don't. It's very revealing and therapeutic writing a book. And I realized that most people are too smart for their own good. And most people will go, hey, I'm going to do this business. What's the first thing I should do if I'm going to do this business? I should write a 400-page business plan. I should write a thesis on it. I should have uh, par bar charts in there. I should have a scale model. I should have – I should focus 10 grand just on the freaking logo. You know, I should get a <laughs> CRM <laughs> And all of these things, what I would do is I would, I would go, well, okay, I'm going to open up a florist. Does anyone want to buy roses from me? No. Right. Well, I'm not going to open up the florist. You know, I would, that's how I would operate. And it was Jay Abraham, who's a good friend of mine, that said to me that I have a, he said, you have a greater I can than an IQ. And I was very proud of that statement because the second that you are given an opportunity, Take it in the next breath and do it. You may be well unqualified, but you know there's a funny thing about experience? You get experience three seconds after you needed it. 
but then you've got it. So if you try something, oh, I can't, uh, that failed. Where did it go wrong? And again, remember, lean in. Oh, I went wrong here. All right, I now know how to do it next time. You know, think about all of the things that you can now do that at one time in your life, you were shit at. Think about this podcast. I guarantee you, no disrespect, the first time you do it, did a podcast, I bet you you were shit. Absolutely. Because as entrepreneurs, the first time we do anything is shit compared to how it'll be six months down the line. Mm. And then how it'll be a year down the line. And then two years down the line. Because you learn from that experience. So I believe that you should do rather than think. Yeah. I reckon you should focus on your I can, not your I can't or your IQ. And just do stuff. You'll be amazed at how many times when you do something that you are ill-qualified, inadequate to do, that purely and simply because you showed up and tried to do it, you pulled it off. Now, I'm a bricklayer from East London. I have a cycle proficiency certificate for when I rode my bike at school and they gave me a little certificate. And I think I got a bronze when, they, when I learned to swim. Not from a competition. I think they just gave me as a participant. Those are the only bloody two things I'm qualified to do. Okay? And here I am charging people millions upon millions of dollars. And more importantly, they're paying it without question. So if I can be doing it and I can be working with Elon Musk and Elton John, you're already out of excuses. Well, there it is. What more leverage of mind do you need? Uh, you're hearing it from the man himself, Steve Sims. And uh, from, from what we might say, a humble beginning uh, and some really entertaining stories. I mean, I love the stories of the, uh, when you got the stockbroker, I'm not going to reveal it now because I don't want to give it away for someone who's reading the book, but somebody, but, but how Steve got uh, a job as a stockbroker and was stockbroker and was flown flown to uh, internationally for the for the job and was fired in about three or five days. Is that something to get the book to read about, Steve? Um, time's gone so quickly, and I want to give you the chance um, to tell us what what you're really excited about at the moment, what you're working on, and is there something you'd like to promote? And where would you most want people to find out more about you? Where would you want them to go? So there's two places. Um, and it depends on where you are in your life as to which one you pick. I have an inner circle where I have, as I just spoke to you about the conversation with billionaires, I have lots of conversations with very powerful people in my inner circle, in my private Facebook group that you get into by being part of Sims Distillery. Now, that's like $300 a year. If you don't want to jump into that, and I can respect that, I have a free Facebook group called an Entrepreneur's Advantage with Steve Sims, where you can learn about these things, learn about me, and really find out if I'm the kind of thing that you want, you know, in your world and in your life. So if you're kind of sitting on the fence and you wonder, well, who the bloody hell is this guy? Is, it, is he full of shit or can he help me? Jump into an Entrepreneur's Advantage with Steve Sims. That's a Facebook group. Or if you really want to start growing, jump in a Sims Distillery. Terrific. So the entrepreneur, the uh, the Facebook group is an entrepreneur's advantage with Steve Sims, and uh, and also uh, the book look out for on Amazon or like I got it on Audible and Steve narrates it himself. Uh, Blue fishing. Um, you will the audience will have Steve the audience will have seen the cover of your book, which you very kindly uh, autographed for me. Uh, so that's terrific. And let me say what an absolute pleasure it's been speaking with you, having this conversation with you, Steve. And like you say in the book, you have this, um, would you call it intuition, uh, where you can size somebody up by the criteria of would you want to sit down and have a beer with them in the pub? And <laughs> if I was still a drinking man, you're the sort of guy I would want to sit down and have 10 beers with, not one. <laughs> we'll have coffee then. Yeah, we'll have a coffee someday. Steve, terrific to be speaking with you. And for the uh, audience and for the listening members, uh, check out Steve Sims uh, online, get his book. I highly recommend it. Bye for now. Tanya, Steve, really, thank you. Very I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>